thank you for giving us another day of your grace and your mercy. Lord, you are so, so good to us. We just want to pause and reflect on your goodness and thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace toward us. Another week of you protecting us, providing for us, leading us, challenging us, growing us, shaping us. Another week where you have been the wonderful potter and we've been proud to be your clay, your trophies of grace. Lord, we're here today to sit at your feet and get our vertical right because we find that when our vertical is right, our horizontal is right. When we're right with you, we're right with those around us. When we're not right with you, we're not right with those around us. We want to sit at your feet and get our minds right, our hearts right. We want to grow. We want to be fed. Lord, we open our hearts and give you access to every part of our lives. We pray that you would find surrendered, yielded hearts in this place. We cast aside all of what we know, all of what we think we know, and we just want to hear from you as little children. Forgive us our many sins, Lord, and we just want to do religious business with you now. We wash at the laver of water and then walk into the Holy of Holies through the wounds of Christ. So minister to us and we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So John chapter 3, it's a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, right? For one, I believe that, well, well, let me just begin with a show of hands. Who's familiar with the story of Jesus and Nicodemus? When's the last time you've read the story? Have you read the story of Jesus and Nicodemus within the last year? You see, what happens is we know it so well that it becomes one of those places that we just don't visit anymore. And what it means is if, look, if every verse of Scripture is shallow enough for a baby to play in, but deep enough for an elephant to wade in, what we're basically doing is we're just basically acting as though there's no more depth in the story. We already know it, been there, done that, and we miss out. What we want to do today is we want to fall in love with this again because, look, this is the story. This is when Jesus reveals how a man, how a woman, how a teenager, how a guy, how a gal gets right with God and goes to heaven. Let me begin by sharing this. There is a heaven. There is a heaven. Revelation 21 and 22 describes heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, The human eye has never seen, the human ear has never heard, the human mind cannot even daydream what God has prepared for them that love him. There is a heaven. Heaven is synonymous with the kingdom of God because what it represents is the place, right, where God's will is the only will. And because God is the source of all life, all light, all joy, all peace, all power, all perfection, it is the place where it is only what is glorious and beautiful. Nothing that defiles, nothing that destroys is there. There is a heaven. The Bible makes clear as well that there is a hell. Jesus likened hell to Gehenna. Gehenna in Israel was this valley, and, you know, basically when you're swinging around old city Jerusalem and you're on your way to another part of Jerusalem, you pass this valley. It was the valley of Gehenna. Actually, it was the valley where they would worship the god Molech. Molech was a statue uh, with the arms of a man, the head of a dog. It was made of like a cast iron. Let me just ask you a question. You ever grab uh, the iron skillet without the oven mitt on and just the number it does? And even though the handle's not under the flame, again, you got that nice third degree burn you won't forget? Well, basically, these statues were metal. What they would do is they would fill the inside with fire. The whole statue would grow hot. And as the drummers began drumming, they would take their babies and place them in the arms of this statue and the babies would fry and cook alive and the drummers would drum to drown out the screams. So whenever you read in the Old Testament that they made the child to pass through the fire, 
It means that they offered up their children to Molech. Actually, King Manasseh, one of the most wicked kings in Israel, offered up his children on those arms to be cooked and fried alive. So that same valley in Jesus' day had become the dump. It is where, and interestingly, the village we go to in Alaska basically has a dump where a backhoe has dug a giant hole, and basically you just pull up and it's always on fire. It's always smoldering. The fire never goes out and you throw your trash in. In Jesus' day, the same valley of Gehenna had become this trash dump. It was always on fire. The fire never went out. The stench was unbearable. The worms in there and the maggots never ceased in activity and you would hear the howls of scavenging animals. It basically was the most hellish smell and the most hellish sound, and it went on day and night, day and night. When Jesus talks about hell, he calls it Gehenna. In other words, he's saying, the closest picture I can give you to what hell is like is this place of, of nonstop shrieking and screaming where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out and the stench is unbearable. Jesus came, and actually it's mind-blowing to see how much Jesus spoke about hell. And it cancels out this wrong view called nihilism, which teaches it just like a log and a fire eventually ashes out, that those who go to hell eventually just kind of ash out and cease to burn. Hell is forever. Heaven is forever. Man has a choice. And when someone goes to hell, it is not because God has sent them there. It is because they have rejected the good news of Jesus Christ and chosen hell. People choose hell. Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that find it. And no one's ever said that broad road to destruction is boring. No one has ever said that broad road to destru destruction is not filled with travel and dreams and bucket lists checked off. There are bucket list items getting checked off all the way to the end of that broad road that leads to destruction. But he says that it leads to eternal darkness. He says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that find it, but narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and very few find it. And the reality is, in a world of lights, camera, action, very few want it. Isn't it interesting that we spend, on average, some 70, 80 years here, and it's really this probationary thing? Naturalists live as though this is their life. So, you know, YOLO, you only live once. That's a lie, right? Everyone lives forever, right? Uh, the time is now. Everyone acts as though this is what it's all about. Build your kingdom now. But the Bible teaches the exact opposite. This, is, this thing called life is really this probationary time period of where everyone is a recipient of God's goodness and grace. And it's of who will respond to that goodness, receive more goodness, come to believe in the cross, and choose to be with God forever. And you know what? It makes sense. It makes sense that there should be a heaven and a hell. There's some people who want God. No matter how much wrong they do, they love God. No matter what a knucklehead they are, they love God. They want the things of God. Evil bothers them. Uh, even if they play a part in it, they, uh, they, it bothers them that they're playing a part in it. There's some that are happy for the day when it's gone, when there's no evil, no darkness, nothing. It makes sense that God will create a place where people like that can have what they want. And then there's some people that don't want Jesus' name mentioned. They just want his name mentioned, maybe if it's just in a quick conversation, but please only five minutes, and let's keep it intellectual because I don't do religion and I don't do politics. And they don't want the name of Christ in anything. They don't want the textbook saying B.C. before Christ. They want the textbook saying B.C.E. before the common era. And they don't want Jesus. They don't want light. They don't want being to be told what to do. They want to do what they want to do. And they don't want any part of God, and it makes sense that God will create a place where they can have what they want. So really, when you think about this heaven and hell thing, it makes sense that God would literally give an option based on what man wants. And when you just, you don't have to be much of a sociologist to just look and see that there are those on both sides. People really fall into those two categories. We live in a world that's divided everybody according to race, socioeconomic breakdown, you know, all of these different things. But it really just comes down to who wants light and looks forward to the day where there will be no darkness, who loves the idea of bowing to their creator, and who detests their creator, resents their creator, and really wants to be their own God. 
He's created two different places. But it says that God is not willing that any should perish. Please write down 2 Peter 3, 9. He's not willing that any should perish. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge of the truth. Isn't that amazing? That he could look at rebellious, treacherous, shifty, shady, sometime me, judicy. And yeah, I just used that as an adjective, judicy. Judas-like, but Judas-y folk. And look at us and still not be willing that any of us should perish, but desire that all of us would come to a knowledge of the truth. Ezekiel 33, 11, it says, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but would have it that a wicked person would turn from their ways and live. That's why even though fire and brimstone fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, you don't read anything in the Bible about people running around in their flesh falling off their bones like wax. But you know what happened. Why isn't it recorded? Because he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. When the ark closed and the waters were rising, you don't think there were accounts of people breaking their fingers and literally breaking every part of their body, banging on the ark to get in? But why is there no mentioning of it? You know what happened. There's no mentioning of water filling people up and who ran to the hills and who went last. And because he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. John chapter 3 comes in and Jesus reveals the most beautiful, beautiful discourse in simplest terms of how a person gets to heaven. Who here wants to go to hell? <clears throat> who wants to go to hell? You know, I was count I've counseled two people who have told me that God, part of how God called them was by showing them hell. Now, seeing a vision of hell doesn't get you saved. Believing in the gospel is what gets you saved. But two different people that I've counseled, and both actually go to this church. One of them just told me two weeks ago his story and said that he would go around telling people that he's God. He had a very difficult life, very hard life. He said he is God. When he dies, it's nothing because he says so. And he would tell people, if God is real, let him show me how tough he is because I'm the toughest thing I know. He broke down crying when he told me two weeks ago the encounter, the story of what he saw. There's another person in the church, the same thing. What the one person said, and again, we don't make a doctrine out of a dream, but I want to show because it literally, you know, if something lines up with Scripture, then obviously we could share it. He said that in his dream that he basically, no, no, I'm sorry. It wasn't even a dream. He had died for seven minutes. That helps the story. The person who shared this with me two weeks ago died for seven minutes. He had heat stroke, so for seven minutes was not breathing. Completely on, I guess, seventh and Allegheny was completely gone. He said that basically he went, and he said, well, for starters, people talk about the golden gates. He says, when I went there, I didn't see golden gates. The gates were more white. I said, well, we're not going to make a doctrine out of this, but it's very interesting because Revelation says that the gates are made of pearl. He says, oh, wow, okay. You know? So he says, I reached for them because they were so beautiful and pretty. And he said, and what I was thinking in my mind is, I'm going to steal one of these. He didn't know he was dead yet. He was like, man, I'm going to take one of these. He says, but he couldn't touch them. He said it was like he saw it but could not touch the gates. He said the next thing is he looked at his skin. And he said when he looked at his skin, it was like black and wispy. And him being just this wild street boy at the time, he wasn't saved yet. He said that when he looked, he said to himself, wow, this is cool. Wow, I'm really bad to the bone now. This is some cool stuff. I'm almost like a superhero. He said, but then he noticed that there was words. And he said, as he began to look at the words, he said what he saw is it was all of his sins he had ever committed. He said at that moment, he read one of them, and he said it's like his face went into it, and he realized he was dead. And he said it's kind of like when you see a lot of different screens. He says when people say their life passed in front of them, he said he saw everything. He said he saw things that he didn't even remember happened, that when he came out of it, he asked his mom, did I get bit by a spider at two years old and have to go to the hospital? She said, yeah, but we never told you that. He said he saw all of that, he said, but in an instance. And then he said, can you imagine, he said to me, and now he's crying, and this is a tough dude, you know, that, who's crying in front of me now two weeks ago. 
And he's recounting what happened before he got saved. He came in and got saved here at Antioch about a year after that experience. But he said, can you imagine, he said, all the pain you've been through in your life, every pain, the abuse, the hurt, the rejection, the physical pain. He said, imagine all of that in your pain coming and experiencing that all funneled into one nanosecond. He said, that's what it's like continually. And then when he began talking about the flames, that's when he began crying. He said, the heat. So again, we don't make a doctrine out of this stuff. But no surprise that, yeah, God calls a lot of us in a lot of ways. And no surprise that for some that really mock God, uh, and it says in the Bible, knowing the terror of God, we beg people to get saved. If it says in the Bible, knowing the terror of God, I'm not surprised are you that God is free to show people what that terror is because he's not willing that any should go there. Having said that, and of course you have to be careful because look, you know, you get someone that's like, oh, I went to hell, you know, come to my conference for $300 and I'll tell you about it. Oh, I saw a heaven, buy my 18 volume set and my MP3 for $1,000 and I'll tell you about it, you know. Uh, I will tell you, people who've shared with me both what they've seen concerning heavenly things and what they've seen concerning hell, uh, they're very humbled at any time when they bring it up. And the last thing you see them doing is tap dancing. It produces a, a very remarkable deep humility. It's very in and out. They're, they're not, you know, it's not, oh, pat me on the back and who wants to hear next and what's the next teaching experience, you know? That being said, the bottom line is this, and now we're coming back to just, you know, we're sola scriptura here, just the word of God, the word of God, the word of God. But we do know that God speaks in visions. The Bible teaches that, right? Right? It says in Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29, in the last days, your young men will see dreams and see visions. We, we know the Bible talks about dreams and visions. But now we're going to come to just what it all points to, because what it really all is meant to do is take you to the word. Every experience has to go back to the word of God. Right? Every experience, every dream, every prophecy has to go back to the Word of God. No matter how amazing it sounds, no matter how, oh my gosh, my hair stood up in my arms when he was talking to me, everything has to go to the Word of God. When you drag it through the Word of God, if it lines up with the Word, okay, well then, hey, praise God. Maybe it is from the Lord. If it doesn't line up with anything in the Word, well then it's got to go. That's how you hold everything up and judge things. 1 Corinthians 14 actually gives good instruction on how you judge prophecy and all different things. You guys, you familiar with that chapter? Okay, let's keep it moving. <clears throat> so here's the thing, right? All right, come on, come on, y'all. Put on the seatbelt. We're going to take the treadmill up to like a 5.6 now. So far, we've only been on the treadmill. It's been like a 3.8. You know the 3.8. 3.8 is when you're still on your phone. You know what I mean? Setting up the AirPods. You know, 3.8. You know, you do a lot of work the remote if you're in front of a TV. You know, but now we're getting up to 5.6. There's no time for any of that no more. All right? So we're at a 5.6 now. Check this out. All right? Check this out. Jesus is going to have a conversation with this guy named Nicodemus, and he's going to tell this dude named Nicodemus how to get to heaven. Here's what's deep. Nicodemus is that dude. Now, we know that everyone's a sinner. We know everyone's a stolen, cold sinner. We know that Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have missed the mark. If it's an arching term, all have pulled back the bowstring, tried to get the bullseye, and missed it horribly. All have sinned. But you know how in life there's just some people that you're like, I know, but that's a good person, though. Right? You're like, oh, I know I shouldn't call anyone a good person, but that's a good person, though. Yeah, come on. You don't know that person. You don't know that person that doesn't walk with God, doesn't talk about God. But they're moral at work. I mean, it's all about it at work. They get every award at work. They're just so nice. You've never seen them in a bad mood. That person that you're kind of like, man, you're more loving than some Christians I know. You mean? Wow, man, you're more loyal to the soil than some believers. You're a good person. Here's what's deep. Jesus is going to have the conversation. Of all the people Jesus could have had the conversation with, about how you got to get into heaven, he has it with the one that you would consider the good person. In other words, we would almost expect that Jesus would have this conversation with the woman of the night. We would almost expect that Jesus would have this conversation with the woman that seven demons came out, came out of. 
We would almost expect that Jesus would have this conversation with Zacchaeus, the stick up boy who was up in the tree or Barabbas. He's having the conversation with the one who, without calling on the name of Jesus, still gets employee of the month, is captain of the block, uh, is the one that wins every board game. Uh, and then it's so humble that they don't, they act like they didn't win. Just that person that seems like that good person. This, of all people, look at the wisdom of God. This is the one he has that conversation with. Because even all of us need it ever, ever, ever instilled in our minds that there's none good, not one. And the only way for any man, all sinful man, kind, is to go through Jesus Christ. And he's going to share that here. So check it out. It says here, and remember when this was written, there was no chapter breaks. There were no chapter breaks. So we're going to go from chapter 2 right into chapter 3. Y'all with me? It says this. Look at John chapter 2, verse 23. And remember, the treadmill's at a 5.6 now. Let's keep it moving. It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. Remember, there were three feasts that every Jewish male in the then known world had to report to Jerusalem for. The city would go up to two to three million people during these feast days. It's saying this is during the Passover feast. Millions of people are there. And what does it say here? It says many believed on his name. Many became believers when they saw the miracles he did. Right? Check this out because this is going to set the stage for Nicodemus. But what does it say here? But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. What did it just say? It says he didn't trust them. It says millions of people are there. It says of those millions, many became believers when they saw the miracles he's doing. But yo, Jesus who knows all things, he didn't trust them. It says that he didn't trust them, meaning he didn't trust them to give them more revelation about himself. He didn't trust them to take them deeper. He saw that they were shallow. And who has the right to do that? Well, Jesus. Write these verses down. Hebrews 4.13. It says that there's no creature that is not manifest in his sight. All things are naked and open unto his eyes to whom we must give an account. Write down John chapter 5, verse 42. Jesus tells the religious rulers, I know you. You don't have the love of God in you. you you're acting like you do, but you don't. John chapter 6, verse 64. He says, there are some of you who don't believe. And then it says, because Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that wouldn't believe and who would betray him. We're looking at Jesus who knows every creature. We're looking at Jesus who knows what really is in every heart. We're looking at Jesus who looked and knew Judas was going to be the one that was going to betray him. Jesus who looks at the religious rulers and says, I know you don't have the love of God in you, no matter what kind of church talk you talk. And then in Revelation 2.23, he says, all the churches will know that I am the one that searches the reins and the hearts. The reins means the kidneys. I'm the one that looks all through your guts and everything, and I know the real deal. So no wonder when we come back to John 2, verse 24, even though many are believing on him, it says that he would not commit himself to them. It just means this. Doesn't mean he doesn't mean he didn't love them. Doesn't mean he wasn't willing that he would, they wouldn't perish. Just means that he did not see in them. Listen, listen. He did not see in them what caused him to want to entrust more heavenly gems to them. He saw that they were just fine with the superficial, they didn't want to go deeper, and that he was not going to be casting out the pearls to those that were going to trample over. Isn't that deep? Would you write this down? Write this down in your notes. For Jesus to entrust himself to believers, there must be progress in their knowledge of him. For Jesus to trust himself to believers, there must be progress in their knowledge of him. To those that are just content to say, yeah, I believe he's uh, everything he says he is. I believe he was a born of a virgin. Who doesn't? Who wouldn't? I believe that he died on a cross. And they don't want any progress in that. They don't want to go any further in that. Well, then, that can be the limit of their knowledge. He is the Lord that says in Psalm 81, verse 10, if you open your mouth wide, I will fill it. The Lord responds to hunger. 
So let me read that quote one more time. For Jesus to entrust himself to believers, there must be progress in their knowledge of him. Now do you understand where he says, to him that has, more shall be given. But to him that has not, it will be taken away even what he has. You're like, what does that mean? Well, here's an example. When the Lord looks around a room and sees those that took what they learned last week, had been meditating on what the Lord showed them last night, and they're thinking on it more, then the Lord says, okay, this person is wanting to progress. They want to know more. So to him that has, more will be given. But for the person that just takes it as, yeah, whatever, man. You know what I mean? I'm here. I'm here, ain't I? <laughs> I obviously believe I wouldn't be here. I'm not in a mosque. I'm not in a Hindu temple. I'm here. I must believe. But that's all they want. It says, to him that has not, it'll be taken away even that which they have. That's why you ever talk to someone and it's like, yo, man, how'd you like service? Yo, man, it was great as always. What was it about? Um, oh, man. Ah, hold on. I can't believe this is happening. Ay, ay, ay. ay. Ah, yeah. The Lord said that to him that has, he'll give you more. But to him that has not, don't really care what you're getting, he'll allow it to slip away. Let's keep reading. So it says, many believed, but he wouldn't commit himself to them because he knew all men. And knowing all men, he knew that this group did not want to progress in their knowledge of him. And he needed not, verse 25, that anyone should testify about man because he knew what was in man. He didn't need anyone to tap him on the shoulder and be like, yo, Jesus, see that one over there in the corner? Yo, she don't play. She's deep. She didn't need, he didn't need anyone to tap him. Hey, you see that young fella right there? You may have a baby face like no tomorrow, but that baby face is hungry. He didn't need anyone to tap him on the shoulder and give him the lowdown because he says he knew all men. You know what? That's amazing that he can know us so well and still love us the way he does. Psalm 139, Lord, you have probed me and known me. It doesn't blow my mind that God probes me and knows me. I expect God to be able to do that. It blows my mind that he could probe me, know me, and still be eternally, indescribably in love with me. So it says he needed not that anyone should testify of man because he knew what was in man. Now, mind you, remember I said there were no chapter breaks? Now is Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This shows you how much Nicodemus was what you would be tempted to call a good person. You follow me now? Remember, there's no chapter break. So it just said many believed on Jesus, but he didn't trust himself to them because he knew what was in them. But there was a ruler of the Jew named Nicodemus. The language is a contrast. It's saying, meanwhile, there was someone who came along that Jesus was ready to trust everything with. That's really showing you from the gate that this Nicodemus dude was the real McCoy. For one, it says that he was a ruler of the Jews. If you want to write down um, John 7, verse 26, if you want to write down Acts 3, verse 17, anytime that is used, it's referring to a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were 70 men who made up the Supreme Court of Israel. 70 religious rulers that made up the ruling body of Israel. They were the Supreme Court. All of the lawyers who interpreted the Bible all answered to them. So here comes this man. Now listen, he is successful. He has power. He has the influence. He is a teacher. Everywhere he goes, he gets carte blanche. He is greeted. Kids are probably getting named after him. We see in John chapter 7, verse 50, when they're about to arrest Jesus, we see the same Nicodemus stand up in John 7, verse 50 and say, hey, is it right to arrest a person when you haven't even heard what he has to say? This man stood for justice. Write down John 19, verse 39. When Jesus was crucified, who was it that took the hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe and all of the beautiful spices? A hundred pounds and went and wrapped Jesus' body. This was a man of empathy. Do you see who, what we're seeing here? We're not seeing the woman of the night here. We're not seeing Zacchaeus, the stick-up kid. Now, mind you, Nicodemus falls short of the glory of God just like everyone else. But what you're seeing here is a man that even a believer would be tempted to say, He's not a believer, 
in Jesus, but he's a good man. This answers the question, do good people go to heaven based on their own works? Do good people go to heaven? And here's the interesting thing. Nicodemus comes to Jesus, but Jesus has to change his thinking because Nicodemus does think that he gets to heaven because of his good works. Nicodemus does think that he gets to heaven because he's part of the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus does think he gets to heaven because he's a descendant of Abraham. Nicodemus actually thinks that. And when you read the story, you kind of get the picture that Nicodemus knows he's a rabbi from God. You follow me? But it's almost like, check it out, y'all, please follow me because we're at a 5.6 on the treadmill. You almost get the picture that Nicodemus is coming on this wise. Yo, I know I'm good. But I'm here to, the people out there need something, and I'm here just to get, become a better person so I can go help people in the world. You follow what I'm saying? But what Jesus is going to show him is that, no, no, you're a sick person that needs a physician. You're a sick person that if you die right now, you will go to hell. And he has to change his thinking. You see, Nicodemus is caught up in a lot of tradition and a lot of cultural thinking that Jesus has to change. I was raised like that. I was raised Catholic. I was raised and taught that you get to heaven, man. You get sprinkled as a baby, and you make your way to that confession booth, talk to that priest, tell him how much you disrespected mama, do whatever he says, stay in good standing, and you will get to heaven. That is no different than what Nicodemus is thinking. See, the trap you fall into there is you're only going to Jesus so that you can get some wisdom to help others. Nicodemus is about to have his whole world changed around because Jesus is going to make clear, no, Nicodemus, I applaud your desire to want to help the world and be a better teacher. But no, Nicodemus, the sickest person in the room right now is you. Because if you are SIN positive, the wages of sin is death, and death is Gehenna, and death is eternal separation. You know, it says in Colossians 2.8, Beware, lest anyone spoil you through traditions after this world that are not after Christ. The Greek word for spoil is when you take a good piece of meat and it's ruined. And that's what traditions can do. You, traditions can be very strong. You can have somebody sitting in a religious system and there's so many around them rehearsing the same thing that you have people believing the exact opposite of what the Bible says. And just as they believed that they would get to heaven just because they were Abraham's offspring, you have others believing they'll get to heaven just because they went and saw the Pope. You have others believe they're going to heaven just because the Pope gave them a blessing or just because they went to St. Peter's Basilica, or just because they were sprinkled by water, or just because a human being said that your sins are remitted. Beware lest anyone spoil you. Nicodemus is that good man, and Jesus loves him so much that, remember, Jesus trusts himself to him. When Jesus just got done looking at a multitude of people and saying, I love you, but you don't want to progress, so I'm not going to entrust any more to you right now. Let's read. So there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was the envy of everyone. Just, moral, empathetic, ready to sacrifice what he had, ready to give, putting together a hundred pounds of aloe and spices to embalm the body of Jesus, ready to give of his money, ready to give of his talents, ready to give of his mind. It says he came to Jesus by night. And interestingly, a lot of people say, well, okay, yeah, to be a member of the Jewish Supreme Court, you had to come to Jesus by night because you could be ostracized because, remember, the religious mob, the Sanhedrin, already wanted to crucify Jesus. But here's another thing, another thing to add to it. Night studies were actually held in high esteem by the rabbis. So is it really that he was coming because he was a coward? Or was it because this is yet another mark of what made this guy just a respectable dude that did the right things? Yo, nighttime was study time for the rabbis. So is he just coming because he's a coward? Or is he also coming because that's what he did? He did what he was supposed to be doing at night. He comes to him and he says this. He says, Rabbi, which means teacher. We, we know that you are a teacher that's come from God because no one can do the miracles that you do unless God is with him. 
we know that you are a true teacher. And he's saying we. Obviously, there were others that were just facing the music but not going public. He's like, I represent a bunch of people, and even if they're not admitting it, we, we, it's, it ain't hard to tell, right? And look at this. Jesus gives him an answer, and it says Jesus answered. But the thing is, notice Jesus isn't answering what he said. What it really means in the Greek is Jesus responded to him. Jesus is going to, because Jesus sees, remember, Jesus knows the heart. Because he sees that Nicodemus wants to progress, Jesus is going to start revealing everything to him. And look at what Jesus begins by saying. Look at this. It says this, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, underline you. You see, Jesus can see that Nicodemus is coming kind of like, hey, I'm going to get some nuggets of wisdom because he's a rabbi. I'm a rabbi. <laughs> we're going to talk rabbi to rabbi. He's a greater rabbi than me, though, because he does miracles. We're going we're gonna to talk as colleagues. He's going to give me some nuggets. I'll become a better person, and I'm going to be better able to go out and help a world be a better place. And look at what Jesus says, verily I say unto you. <laughs> See what Jesus said? He didn't say, hey, verily, verily, I say unto the people you're going to go visit. Verily, verily, I come, I, I say to the people you represent. He says, no, Nicodemus, I'm telling you something. I'm telling you this. And he's cutting right through his traditions, right through him thinking he's going to get to heaven by his own works, right, that he's going to get to heaven just because he's Abraham's offspring. He cuts through all of that. And he says, Nicodemus, I'm going to tell you this. It ain't for you to tell others. It's for you to eat first before you tell others. And look at what he says. Verse 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Greek word for again actually is anothem. It means unless a man is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See actually means this. It doesn't just mean you won't get there. It means you won't even have the eyes to see it. You won't even be able to see it. You cannot see the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom of God represents heaven. But the kingdom of God is also God's message to mankind is revealed in Scripture. The kingdom of God is also a heart that's bowed to the Lord and walks with him and can actually sense what God is saying. God is telling me I got to stop this. God is convicting me about this. God is encouraging me about this. God is speaking to me about this. It says, if you're not born from above, you will, you, it will be like, it's like explaining to a baby that's in utero what the outside world is like. You're only this far away from it. You're only this far away from it, but it's right around you, but you, there's no way you can even understand it. He's saying if you're not born from above, you will not be able to see the things of the Spirit of God. You will not be able to see the things of the kingdom of God. And here he's telling this to one of the most respected, most just, most empathetic, most philanthropic, amazing guys walking through Israel who even has the humility to come to Jesus in the middle of the night and who was up at night doing his homework when he should be. And he says, you, with all of your merits and everything, if you're not born from above, you will not see the things of the kingdom of God. You won't see it. You won't go there and you won't even see what's right under your nose. You need the Holy Spirit. Look at this. Nicodemus said to him, well, how can a man be born when he is old? And it looks like he's asking a, a, a silly question, but it's actually a very deep question. Follow this. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mom's womb and come back out again? What he's basically saying is this, and it's deeper than just saying, what do you mean born again? I'm an old man. Do I go back in utero and come back out again? Is that what you mean born again? Is that what you mean born from above? He's asking more than that. This is a very intellectual man. This is actually what he's asking him. He's saying, Jesus, you're talking about being born, being made new from above. I'm already born. I already have personality. I already have personality with baggage. I already have personality with baggage formed by those who raised me, who had already formed personality with baggage. I am the summation of all of my life experiences, good, bad, and ugly. I am the, the byproduct of those that have nurtured me and raised me and all of their experiences. I am the summation of my yesterdays, my last years, and my last decades. How does all of that change? 
That is what he's actually asking him. How deep is that? So you realize that this isn't some, some superficial light conversation here. He's asking something very deep. He says, all of what I am, my whole ball of wax is very complex. How can, how can anything new happen with this? Wow. Now do you see why Jesus is revealing so much? While he just was around the multitude and says he wouldn't trust his knowledge and his depth to them, to Nicodemus, he's now sharing everything. What was the quote again? Jesus, for Jesus to entrust himself to believers, there must be progress in their knowledge of him. What he means is he wants to see us doing something with what we're learning about him. Deeper meditations, deeper oh wows, deeper oh wow. I, I forgot about that. Let me think about that again. Deeper, oh man, I've been downplaying that. Let me stop downplaying that. Just what you're doing with what he's given you, right? This, is, this should be very encouraging, by the way, right? Because he's telling us how to go deeper in him. Boom, let's keep it moving. So Jesus answers and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He's saying, this birth is spiritual and this is supernatural. Because he's like, hey, I'm a complex ball of wax. How do I get made new? And they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I'm an old dog. How do I learn new tricks, let alone become new? Jesus says, no, no, no. It's supernatural. You have to be born of water and of the Spirit. Now, some say that water means, oh, you have to be water baptized. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But you see, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, that by grace you're saved. You're saved and forgiven by grace. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Through faith. And then it says, not of works. It's not by your works. It says, it's a gift of God, and it's not by works, and that's why nobody can brag. It then says this. Write this down. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Are you ready for this one? And I double-checked the Hebrew this morning to make absolutely sure. Isaiah 64, verse 6. For the person that thinks their good works will get them to heaven. It says in Isaiah 64, verse 6. We are all as an unclean thing. And all of our righteousnesses, all of our best foot forward, are filthy rags before him. Do you know what the Hebrew word for filthy rag actually is? It's used menstrual cloth. It's saying that if you think that you could present your good works to God and on that grounds get into heaven, the Lord sees it as used menstrual rags, which meant you were ceremonially unclean in the Old Testament and couldn't enter the temple. So just like one could not enter into the temple with used menstrual cloth, one cannot enter into heaven with your best foot forward, which in God's sight is used menstrual cloth. It can never get into the temple. Man can never get to heaven by good works. Why do you think John the Baptist said to the self-righteous Pharisees, don't start bragging about being the children of Abraham. You better repent because God could turn these rocks into the children of Abraham if he wanted to. So when Jesus says here, <clears throat> except a man be born of water and of the spirit, what is he referring to? Remember, John the Baptist came on the scene and said, I baptize you with water, but there comes one mightier than me. The water baptism represented repentance. Water also represents hearing the word of God, Ephesians 5, 26, the word of God's called water. Romans 10, 17 says our faith gets activated when we hear the word of God. When we hear how to get saved, we place our faith in that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what he's saying is this. Check it out what he's really saying to him. He's saying, Nicodemus, you're wondering how a complex ball of wax like you can be born again. He's saying it has to happen by water and by the Spirit. Water means you have to be willing to repent. You have to be willing to repent of all of your sins and agree with what God says about them. Two, God provides the Spirit. So actually, man and God meet. Man brings the water, the baptism of repentance, meaning a repentant heart. God then gives the forgiveness and gives the Holy Spirit, and that is how we are then born again. You see how he's breaking all this down to him? 
So he says in verse 6, that which is born of, of the flesh is the flesh, Nicodemus, but that which is born of the spirit is the spirit. He's trying to get Nicodemus away from thinking about it in, 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 in the physical. Really what he's doing here is Nicodemus is supremely intellectual. He's teaching Nicodemus, your intellect is a blessing, but it's getting in the way right now. And how many are those that their intellect just simply gets in the way because they have to master something in order to somehow believe it? If I put a physics formula on the board with all the different constants of gravity, are you guys ready to, or do you need to be able to solve all of that and get A's in physics all throughout Harvard and MIT and Purdue Engineering in order to believe in gravity? Or are you still afraid of heights even though you, got, you get F's on those papers? Are you still afraid of airplanes and turbulence even though you get F's on those papers? You see, you don't need to understand something fully in order to believe it. Look at how you operate with gravity. You can't explain it to nobody. But you're very careful on edges. You're very careful when your kids get on edges because you believe in it even though you don't fully understand it. He's saying, Nicodemus, you're a sharp, you're a sharp tool. You're a smart cookie, but your brains are getting in the way right now. He says, that which are born of flesh is flesh. I'm talking about being born of the spirit. Let's keep reading. Marvel not, verse 7, that I said you must be born again. He's like, stop thinking so much. Verse 8, he says, take the wind. The wind blows where it wants. And you hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell where it's coming from. You can't even tell where it's going. So is everyone that's born of the spirit. He says, think of the wind. You don't see wind but you see its effects. You're not going to see all of this, Nicodemus. You'll see it with the eyes of faith, but it's just like the wind. You don't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. You see the trees move. You see the leaves move. You're not going to see it, but you're going to see the effects. And what are the effects in our life? The fruit of the Spirit. We know when the Lord moves into our heart because you change. You become a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Things that didn't used to bother you, bother you. Ways you used to be, you no longer want to be. Things that before you didn't struggle with, now you struggle with. At least now you struggle. Before, before it wasn't a struggle at all. It was a no-brainer. It was like, well, how, I, why not do this a million times over? Now it bothers you. You change. You're a different person. Not spending time with God bothers you. Not going to church bothers you. Not loving someone bothers you. And it's more than just the actions. Then your attitude bothers you. I remember when I was in the world, I didn't care if my attitude was bad. As long as you didn't know, psh, I could wish you were dead. I could wish you and your whole family were dead. But as long as I didn't show you, then there was no way you knew. And I walked away and I was like, hey, everybody wins. I got to wish you were dead and you didn't know and whatever. But no, but when you become a born again believer, even though no one on the planet knew about your attitude, it bothers you. What about your motives? When I was a non-believer, it was all about my manners. As long as my manners were cool, you didn't need to know my motive. I was hanging out with you just because you had money, and I wanted some of it. But as long as you didn't know, that didn't matter. I wasn't bothered. It was like, as long as I behaved and had the right manners, I didn't. But then you become a born-again believer. Now your motives. And then the Lord wrestles with you. The Word of God opens up to you. When I was a non-believer, I used to rip out Bible pages and roll joints. It was one of the best alternatives to rolling. It was an alternative to rolling paper. I'm sorry I didn't say the best alternative. No, but yeah, in my unsaved days, it was the best alternative to rolling paper. I got to keep it PG, y'all. Like, I'm, pray for me. But I'm talking about that dude. It was a name full of big names. And who, who's Mephibosheth? Why does it matter? This, this genealogy is driving me crazy. Then the Spirit of God moves in. You're like, yo, this genealogy is unbelievable. Whoa, Tamar, wow, you know, uh, Rahab the harlot is in the genealogy of Jesus? What? This is a genealogy of grace? He allows a harlot named Rahab to be in his genealogy? And then it says in Hebrews 2.10, he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters? Wow, he doesn't just talk it, he does it. I know family that won't even list this person, won't even name that this person's in their family. He's got Rahab the harlot proudly in his genealogy. See, but when you get saved, the Bible opens up. When the author of the Bible moves into your heart, the Bible opens up. It's about being a new creature. And he's saying, Nicodemus, you're not going to see the wind, but you're going to see the effects of the wind. He's saying, Nicodemus, let your mind lead you to what I'm saying, but, but, but it's time for you to place your, your faith in who I am and what I'm saying. 
So then he says, Nicodemus answers and says to them, how can these things be? Underline that. Because now what you're seeing is a progression with Nicodemus. Because now Nicodemus moved from, um, I don't know, Jesus, you got to break this down a little more, to now he's actually saying, okay, rabbi, how can I get this eternal life? There's a progress here. And do you see how Jesus keeps giving more? Again, I want to read that quote again. For Jesus to entrust himself to believers, there must be progress in their knowledge of him. Yo, isn't this a story that just gets you back to being excited all over again about just being born again and hopefully equipping you to be able to share with people? And doesn't, don't you appreciate so much Nicod who Nicodemus' character was? The Bible really is giving him a lot of compliments. But even those that get the most compliments in the Bible are still sinners that need to ask for forgiveness. Mary needed the blood of Jesus just as much as me just as much as you. The Catholic Church will teach you the immaculate conception. Do you know immaculate conception and virgin birth are two different things? Some people think it's synonymous. I was raised the immaculate conception. The immaculate conception teaches that Mary was sinless and remained sinless. The Bible does not teach that at all. The Bible teaches that she remained a perpetual virgin. The Gospels tell you in many accounts that she had other children after Jesus. She was a virgin when Jesus was born. But do you see how just as Nicodemus had to be corrected from a lot of traditions that were not biblical, though they were very strong and prevalent, so many of us have to be corrected of a lot of traditions. But look at the love of God. And let me tell you, by the way, my grandmother died as a Catholic. Died in my arms as a Catholic. You know what she said to me? She said, when I grew up down in Virginia, Aaron, as a mulatto, as a half Cherokee Indian girl and half Jewish and was rejected by everyone because to be half Jewish and Indian in Virginia back in that day, she said it was the nuns that took me in and loved me. She said, so now I understand it's all Jesus. Now I understand that it's all about receiving Jesus, but just in love for the ones who took me in, I'm just going to remain proud to be Catholic. Praise God. Because in heaven, there's not a Baptist section. There's not a Pentecostal section, Presbyterian section, Catholic section, or anything. Heaven is made up of individuals who respond the same way Nicodemus responds. It's made up of individuals who have made the decision to repent and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. Let's keep reading. So he says, how can these things be? Look at what Jesus says. Verse 10, Jesus says to him, Art thou a master of Israel and don't know these things? Do you know actually in the Greek, he's calling him the master. Nicodemus was the man. And that's why Jesus is saying the definite article there is the. Are you not the teacher? Are you not the man and you don't know this? He's holding Nicodemus accountable for not seeing what the Old Testament taught about this. Verily, verily unto you, we speak what we know, and we testify what we've seen, but you don't receive our witness. Jesus is bringing himself to the witness stand, John the Baptist to the witness stand, and all the prophets in the Old Testament that said, Ezekiel said, the days will come where I will give Israelites a new heart. I will take away the heart of stone and give it a heart of flesh. He's saying, we've been talking about this, but he's saying, you've been caught up in your church traditions and not been getting in the word. If I've told you earthly things, verse 12, and you believe not, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things, he says. Now, this is where it gets deep, but let me read the quote again. For Jesus to entrust himself to believers, there must be progress in their knowledge of him. You'd almost feel like Jesus is telling him, like almost like the sensei, class is over. If I tell you earthly things and you don't get it, how are you going to get heavenly things? And like he walks away. It, but it, does, it can read like that if you read it quickly. But no, he's about to take him into the heavenly things, but he's prepping him. He's like, yo, he's basically telling him, put your seatbelt on, because now we're going from 4,000 feet in a little prop plane. Now we're going up in a rocket ship. And yo, check it out what he's about to do. He says, verse 13, no man has ascended up to heaven, only he that came down from heaven. He's saying, I'm the one that's come down from heaven with the message, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. What it means is the Son of Man whose abode is in heaven. He's saying, even as I'm here, I'm the one that came down from the throne. I'm the one who inhabits eternity, Isaiah 57, 15. And then he says this, check this out. Now he's about to take him into the heavenly things. 
He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Underline lifted up. Now, for us to see lifted up, lifted up, lifted up, what's that mean? Let me tell you, in this day, with the Roman government, lifted up was a known fact that it meant being crucified. See, that's when we read it helps to know the cultural context. To be lifted up was slang for, yo, a Roman crucified somebody. A Roman, a Rome crucified another person. He's saying this, yo, Nicodemus, I'm about to take you real deep now. He says, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Do you remember? Check it out. Now, check it out. Y'all ready? What happened in the wilderness? Write down Numbers 21, 4 through 9. And this is my first of 18 closings. No, it's going to be my first of two. If y'all do it right, it's my first of two. Y'all got to be hype with me, though. This should get you excited. Numbers 21, verse 4 through 9. It's my first of two closings. The Israelites were in the wilderness. Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. It says that they didn't like the way God was leading them on the way. They didn't like it. There wasn't enough, uh, you know, virgin pina coladas. There wasn't enough regular pina coladas. There wasn't enough, you know, slip and slides. And it just wasn't where they wanted to be going. So they began murmuring against God for like the 10th or whatever time. Like, yo, we should have just stayed in Egypt and died. What did God do? God allowed serpents to bite them. People began dying. Even in God's judgment, though, he's so merciful. As people were dying, he said to Moses, Moses, Get brass and fashion it into the shape of one of those serpents. Put it on a pole and hold it up in the air. Whoever is dying of that bite, if they look at that pole, they will live. So sure enough, anyone who looked at that pole would live. Now, there was nothing magic about that pole. Matter of fact, Hezekiah would have to come along some... Time later, centuries later, and he would have to break it and call it Nehushtan, which means a thing of brass. Hezekiah would literally have to come along and smash it because the Israelites began worshiping it. There was nothing special about that brass serpent. Do you know what it was? Follow this, y'all. It was just people doing what God said and believing it. See what he's saying to Nicodemus? The same way they just looked, did what God said and believed. He said, I'm just telling you, you want to know how to get to heaven? Just look at me dying for your sin on that cross and believe and do what I say. Repent and you will live forever. He's making it real simple for him. But he's taking him up to the heavenly ways now, right? And then he says, whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And then he says the two verses that we all celebrate and know. Nicodemus is the one that got this nugget. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but will have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world, through him, the world might be saved. Read it again and put your name in. For God so loved Aaron. See, I always believed that Jesus died for the world. I remember getting my crucifix for my communion, then I lost it. My grandma brought me another one for my confirmation, and I lost it. I always knew that Jesus died for mankind. But I went to an Ivy League university as a neuroscience major and went all the way through, went through all of that education and edumacation. Never knew that he died for me. God so loved the world. Put in your name. God so loved Aaron. How much did he love Aaron? Put your name in. That he gave his only begotten son. He loved me so much that he gave his son to be that serpent on the pole. Remember, the serpent represents evil. The serpent represents sin. The serpent represented the devil. The serpent represented death. The serpent represented the fall. Brass is a form of judgment. It meant that death and evil and sin being judged. That's why when they looked up at it after being bit by the snakes, they lived. Jesus is saying, I'm going to be lifted up and crucified meaning I will be your curse. I will take darkness for you. I will take death for you. I will take separation and, and rejection from God for you. I will take all of that for you. Jesus is the one that likens himself to the serpent on the pole, not us. Isn't that deep? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him will not perish but will have everlasting life. And then I love this, verse 17. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Put your name in it. God 
did not send his son into the world to condemn Aaron, but that through him, Aaron might be saved. What it should say is that God sent his son to condemn Aaron. The way it should read is that Aaron, he was in New York one night talking like he was going to live forever. He went around a corner and boom, God sent his son to knock his block off. Or just make him vaporize and go to hell. But it says that he didn't send his son into the world to condemn me. He sent his son into the world to save me. He sent his son into the world to save you. To save us from our self-righteousness, our pride, our arrogance, our self-will. To save us from us, our sin, our envy, our murder. Everything. Jesus said, out of the heart comes adultery, theft, murder, fornication. He said, these things just naturally spew out of the heart. Jesus came and paid the price for all of it. And what did he say on the cross? Tetelestai. What does that mean? In Aramaic, it means paid in full. I paid it all. So you see, this is the message we have. And I would encourage you to reread the story. You should be able to explain to someone what it means to be born again, what it means to be born from above. It says in 1 Peter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God that lives and abides forever. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. It is a gift. Can you imagine what heaven would be like if we got there by works? Can you imagine how obnoxious it would be? One, Jesus would get no glory, no props. It would just be, uh, and it'd be all divided. Like, yo, we're the million dollar club. You know, well, yo, we're, we're, we're in the hood. Our good works, we're the hood club. We did our good works in the hood. Yo, we were the ones like, we're the corporate good works club. It would turn into hell. <laughs> we'd make it hell it'd be division it'd be bananas if you got there by works well here it was man i'd done some dirt but you know something i'm smart i'm smart though mama didn't raise a dummy i'm smart i had a feeling i got this chest pain and and i went and got checked and i found out that genetically i'm predisposed to this i found that i had a year to live man i went into the peace corps for that year man i did it up gave up a kidney gave up an arm gave up a leg and listen went into the army did this, went to med school, did it all in a year, helped people, went to leper colonies, and that's why I'm here. Can you imagine what it would be like if we got there by works, and Jesus would be in the middle, and the lamb that was slain would get no praise, but because it's only because of the blood of Jesus, that is why it says in the Bible, we rest not day and night, and all we say is worthy is the lamb. That's why we take our crowns and Revelation 4, cast them at his feet. That's why it says in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, let not the rich man brag about his riches. Let not the strong man brag about his strength. Let not the wise man brag about his wisdom. And isn't it interesting? We live in a world that's all people do. People are either bragging about how wise they are, how rich they are, or how strong they are and how much muscle they got behind them. It says, don't brag about this. If you're going to brag, brag about one thing. You know, the only thing we're allowed to brag about in the Bible is that we know and understand God. Now, we get pulled into the trap of the world and find ourselves talking dumb talk and bragging about a bunch of dumb stuff. But because we're new creatures, it bothers you now. Because you're new creatures, you get convicted. So I told you that was my second and final closing, and I meant it. But here's the key now. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. It says this, examine yourself. Let me tell you, we got three dogs at home. I don't want to say anything bad about them, so I'll let it be brief. I'll go home just to make sure the gate's closed in the back. Double check. How many of y'all go home just because you think the back door is... I get up at 3 in the morning just to go make sure the back door's shut. Leave and drive back. Just make sure the iron's off. It says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself. Make sure you're really born again. Because Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 22, that when he returns, a lot of people are going to run up to him and say, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, I never knew you. Make sure that you truly, truly are born again and that you're just not in church. 
God must really feel a strong way about this because he says it again in 2 Peter 1.10. Make your calling and election sure. Make sure you're really born again again. It really sounds like a Lord who really loves us and really wants us to spend eternity with him, but also knows our hearts are so deceitful. You ever think somebody hated you and you were dead wrong? You ever think somebody liked you and you were dead wrong? <laughs> yo, man, this person hates me. They're mad at me. They're mad at me. They're mad at me. Then they, they call like, yo, what's good? I've just been shopping for you. Or everything like, yo, that's my ace. This person's my ride or die. They'll go all out for me. And that person's like, yo, man, I don't even know you no more. We have a knack for swearing something and being absolutely wrong. That's why the scripture comes in because our hearts are so deceitful and says, make sure you're born again. Make sure you're saved. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. He wants us to be in glory with him. A perfect savior for perfect sinners and gives perfect forgiveness. Amen. Let's have the worship team come up now. And let this just be a time of reflection. Um... For those who've not had conversations with loved ones, prayerfully today has, a, has helped you with that. Acts 4.12, it says there's no other name under heaven that people could be saved by. Galatians says if there's any other way for people to get to heaven, Christ died for nothing. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father unless they come through the Son. Jesus said, I'm the door. Anyone that comes up the wall is a thief and a robber. Jesus talks about the wedding ceremony and people are in there and don't have the right clothing on. It means you're coming in your own righteousness. You don't have the righteousness that only happens when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. They get ousted from the wedding. Jesus keeps giving these stories of people thinking there's a back door, a side door, an underground tunnel, and every story he's calling people out and saying, if you don't come through me, you could be sincere. There are sincere Muslims. There are sincere New Agers. I used to be one. There are sincere Taoists. There are sincere occultists. There are sincere naturalists. But they're sincerely wrong. And not because I say so. Oh, who's Pastor Aaron think he is now? You know, he should have been done by now. No, not because I say so, because the Bible says so. Jesus is the one doing the heavy lifting. He's the one that said, there's no other way except through me. And there's no other answer for death. Only the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the answer for death. Ask an evolutionist why we die. Oh, they'll try to tell you what monkey we came from, but ask, why do we die? Why is there the second law of thermodynamics? Why do things tend toward disorder? Why? Why? Why is there corrosion? Why is there entropy? They won't be able to answer you. Why is there evil? They won't be able to answer you. Where did evil come from? They won't be able to answer you. Even the Muslim will tell you, well, we don't know for certain that you can get to heaven. But then they teach, but if you die in jihad, then you can go to heaven, and heaven will look like having 70 virgins for all of eternity for to have pleasures with. Can't all be true. There's one truth, and that's the Bible. It's the only book that tells us history before it happens. It's the only book that lays out the scientific accuracy, the historical accuracy. And remember, you're looking at someone who hated this book. When I was an Ivy Leaguer at UPenn, this book made me sick. It actually made me laugh, because you have to be mad to get sick. I would laugh at it. Until I stopped listening to what everyone else had to say and studied it for myself. This is the word of God. This is the truth. And I pray that if you've not given your life to Jesus, would you just give a thought right now, because it says, and notice, you know how the Bible ends? The Bible ends with an invitation. It says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let whoever hears this, come. And let him that is thirsty come. And whoever will, let him drink of the water of life freely. The Bible ends with an invitation to come. So maybe listen to this today, and maybe today is the day that you make sure, that you make sure. Because I tell you what, if you die, the only sin he can't forgive you of is dying without making him Lord and Savior. You die, it's too late. Hebrews 9.27 when you die, you must be judged. It's too late. You've got to call on the one who beats your heart before your heart stops. That's the name of the game. And a lot of people, most people die and it was not on their to-do list that day. So today is the day. People say, how do I know if it's the right day? If you understand the message, today is the right day. And if you're like, oh, I'm not doing it today. 
How could you even be having that argument unless the Lord was drawing you? What do you, if you say, ah, no, I ain't, I ain't going up there. Why? You wouldn't even have that response if God wasn't even doing this. You wouldn't even be pulling back unless God was pulling you this way. So let's worship now and just ask yourself that question. If I die right now, do I know of a certainty that I've repented of my sin and I'm ready to look death right down the barrel and know who my Redeemer is and know that I'm going to heaven? Not based on my report card, but based on the report card of my Savior. And then he died on the cross for all my F's on my report card. Father, we just thank you for this time and we just pray that you would just enlarge this message in our hearts. Would you get us excited once again about the greatest message we have for a polarized, hyper-politicized, pseudo-intellectual world? And get us excited about this message once again. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for Nicodemus, the one you chose to have this beautiful conversation with. And Lord, we just want to rededicate our hearts to you, Lord. It's, we live in a world that pulls us in so many directions, but we want to fall in love with this once again. Would you, Holy Spirit, just drop upon us afresh and just make us love the things of God as we ought to, Lord. Lord, would you receive this morning's offering? Would you receive it as worship from us to you? Be glorified with every penny, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.